our, our panelists this year have a have a heavy a heavy burden to to live up to last year's, but um, but I know they're up to the challenge um, because these two folks um, share something that's a little bit unusual in Washington these days. They are career, long term, decorated, award winning journalists with the same publications. So, folks, look, look closely what you're seeing here. Um, we're really, we're really proud of this. Not sure how much more of this you're going to see, um, but um, to my left we have Karen DeYoung, who has been with the Washington Post since 1975, <laughs> who um, exemplifies the do a little bit of everything. You know her as a national security foreign policy correspondent. Um, Pulitzer Prize winner, editor. She's also covered Maryland politics. I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> yeah. it's done a little bit of everything and um, has been um, putting out coverage that, that those of us, those of us who work on the advocacy side, often envy how Karen knows what she knows, and we wish we knew what she knew. Um, to my right, we have James Fallows, who has been with the Atlantic for a similarly impressive amount of time, but. Um, Particularly, um, there's the the sort of secret secret former speechwriter society here tonight, which which Jim belongs to. Um, yes, yeah, I saw the secret salute back there. <laughs> so um, Jim has uh, written more books and won more book awards than any of you all want to hear about at this point in the evening, because what you really want to hear is the two of them giving the unvarnished, ugly, unpartisan. Real politic talk about what we are going to face the next 18 months in the intersection between the actual policy challenges we face and the political environment that is staring down at us. So um, I'm going to turn to Karen to go first, and then Jim, and then we uh, we look forward to we look forward to having a discussion that is that is lively, that is frank, and um, unlike the previous part of the program, that is on the record. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Um, I, I don't. I don't plan on yelling. I don't know, but we'll see what Jim has to say. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit, bring us down a little from the from the um, policies we wish were being enormously successful to what's actually sort of going on and and what's going to go on in the next year and a half. Obviously, uh, the campaign and the budget battles have a very direct effect on foreign policy. Um, as we all know, virtually all of the Republican candidates have charged that Obama is too soft and that he has, as Mitt Romney put it last week, pursued a series of th strategies that lead to our decline economically and militarily. Uh, Romney said he would put in place changes to keep America the leader of the world. So we'll see whether he has any specifics in mind when he gives his first major foreign policy speech on Friday. Um, but in general, Republicans say, and even some Democrats say, th that Obama has not stood up for Israel, has ignored the threat growing uh, uh, from Chinese economic and military power, has let Iran get away with murder, has allowed Russia to dictate missile defense policy, and in general has made America weak. Um, I think we, we could each delve into the factual basis of those claims, and, and I believe that the administration, in fact, has a very good case on at least some of them that that's not really true. But I think that the campaign will push the administration um, in directions that it might not naturally want to go. Um, we've already seen evidence that of, of that uh, in U.S. policy toward the Middle East peace process. Um, as a candidate against George Bush, Obama said that what was lacking was personal presidential involvement and that he would be personally and publicly involved um, in the peacemaking effort um, and bring pressure to bear on both sides. I think it's fair to say that the president has not had much public personal involvement in the peace process. And I think that as the campaign goes on, you'll see the administration exerting perhaps less force rather than more and in essence trying to put uh, a very hot button issue on hold until the election. Um, in terms of the budget itself, Hillary Clinton's call for more smart power and her efforts to compare the relatively paltry amount of money that goes uh, to uh, the State Department compared to how much goes to the Defense Department are unlikely to save her budget from taking substantial cuts 
that will affect foreign policy in many places and in a number of ways. Obviously, the battle over the defense budget uh, is likely to be a much more interesting one as Republicans and Democrats are torn between deficit reduction and what they see as a continuation of U.S. dominance. Um, I think these battles at home have a real impact on what's happening abroad as events march on and the administration's perceived ability to deal with them diminishes. Uh, just to cite a few examples, and I'll just throw these out and perhaps we can talk to, about them in the discussion time. Um, European partners in Mideast peace, peacemaking, certainly in the quartet, are exasperated over the constraints that they feel domestic politics have placed on the administration. The Palestinian push for recognized statehood is not going to go away, and some of these partners feel that there needs to be a more robust uh, response. Um, the Afghan war, I think, in some ways is likely to get worse before it gets better, if it gets better. Um, the administration said months ago that it expected to have made major progress toward reconciliation by the end of this year. Um, I don't think we've seen a whole lot of evidence of that unless they have some great surprises that they're going to present in the next couple of months. Um, I think flexibility in Afghan troop withdrawals is increasingly constrained by growing public opinion that believes too much money is being spent on a war there that it doesn't quite understand in terms of its objectives and whether they're achievable. Um, State Department efforts to preserve a viable relationship with Pakistan um, seem increasingly futile, and the administration is divided over what to do about the country that it says has to be part of the solution in Afghanistan. I think the ability to develop a nuanced response to the very real internal political conflict in Iran will become more difficult as uh, charges that Obama has not been tough enough in dealing with Iran continue, again, in the, in the political context. Um, the ongoing push for increased burden sharing within NATO, something that Defense Secretary Panetta spoke about again even this week, uh, becomes a harder case to make as the United States contemplates defense cuts. I think we could all come up with a list of things uh, that are going to continue to be foreign policy challenges over the next year and a half, uh, that the, that the um, economic situation is going to have a big impact on, and that the political campaign, perhaps an even bigger one, um, how to deal with Egypt during this fragile period, uh, how to preserve but guide the increasingly important relationship with Turkey, what to do about Putin's bloodless coup in Russia, uh, Europe's financial chaos, uh, again, uh, Iraq's fragile democracy. I'm sure you all have your favorites and that, that will bring some of these up during the discussion. So I'll, I'll let Jim tell us what his... Well, I'll just say I just disagree on every point. So how about that? Does that meet the burden of, of last year? No. Um, thank you. And since Karen has been admirably... Um, taking the big view and covering all the different parts of foreign policy. I can be um, particular on one part of the world that I've known about recently and, and how the current American travails look for that, that, that part of the world. So for most of the past five years, I've been either living in China or traveling in uh, Japan or Korea or Indonesia or, or, or Malaysia. And the the impressions I've gotten from that time as they bear on us and what's ahead during the election year, I would list this way. First, it's been a surprise to me that I think people in the rest of the world in general know America better than we think. You know, there is such a texture of connections that people, even in Indonesia and even in rural China, have with parts of American life, whether it's a cousin who's been to Michigan State or a movie they saw or a TV show, or, or there is a more textured view of the goods and bads of American life than, than I think we sometimes allow for, which gives people some buffer in knowing that there are ups and downs in, in, the, um, in the circumstances we have and sometimes keeps them from having too sweeping a, 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 uh, an opinion. Obviously, I'm generalizing grossly about uh, six billion people outside the United, the United States, but that would be a, a first premise to be offset by the second that also people know us worse than we would think. Any of you who've lived in or worked in 
countries that see themselves as being weaker than the United States know the uh, prevalence to conspiracy thinking, which, which goes on. It's certainly the case that in China, even though it is in some ways uh, a match for the United States, every single person there believes the bombing of the embassy in the Balkans had to have been intentional, because how could the U.S. make that kind of mistake? No one in Washington would ask how could the U.S. make that kind of mistake, because we, we, we know. And so there is a weakness to conspiracy uh, theory. There is a, a tendency, as I'll get to in a moment, to assuming greater degrees of imperial decline that I think may be, may be actually, um, actually warranted. So I'm, I'm building to a conclusion here. First point is there's a greater knowledge of some of our variety than we may think. Second, there is a corresponding proneness to certain misinterpretation systematically of what we're doing. We're doing. Third, I'd say in most of the countries I have experience with, their interest in U.S. foreign policy pretty much boils down to what's in it for them. What is it going to mean in trade policy for Taiwan? What is it going to mean about a free trade agreement here or there? And so the, the degree of time most foreign people outside think tanks spend thinking about the general nature of American foreign policy is limited compared to what it means for a tariff for their products, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the next point I would make that struck me, especially while living in China during the, uh, the 2008 presidential campaign, is that I think there is some... There's, it has been built in some appreciation even among the most resentful parts of the, of, the, uh, of the diaspora outside the United States of some of the things that are good about the United States. And, and I, in the middle of, of angry conversations I'd be having someplace in China about the things the U.S. was doing wrong and oppressively or whatever, the fact that um, the United States was able to succeed a Bush-Cheney administration with an Obama-Biden administration, especially in the just in the mere fact of that sort of change of course was uh, something that, that did impress a lot of people. As a related point, as many of you probably know from your, your electronic devices, uh, while you've been having dinner, Steve Jobs has died. And it is, it is striking, I guarantee, that around the world this will be major news and, and, and something that will be reflect on him, of course, and his company, but also the United States is the kind of culture that could create this sort of person, and you really couldn't imagine this, all the circumstances that uh, allowed him to do what he has done uh, prevailing anyplace else. And so there is you know, an appreciation more than we would think, even in dark times, of the parts of our culture that can allow uh, political renewal, can allow this kind of creativity. You know, there are lines and stores all around the world for, for his, his product. The, the final point, however, I will say that has struck me and that will bear on what happens next, uh, next election year is how many people, at least on the Pacific Rim, where I've been hanging around them in, 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 recent, while, in, in, in the recent years, are willing to, to think that this is finally the time for American decline. That, yes, we've had the ups and downs over the years, and in my role as an increasingly long-lived American. I've seen these ups and downs and on my, my own watch and know how difficult and how prone to uh, decline the United States has seemed at past times in my, my conscious life. But I, my impression, I was in Australia during the, uh, the depths of the, the debt uh, ceiling uh, debate, and it was really striking to read the commentary from uh, that part of the world, the fact not the United States was actually going to not uh, to, to default, but that it was seriously considering doing so. And, and I, I think people outside the United States and our major, uh, our major partner countries who have not steeped themselves in the history of the Civil War or the history of the Gilded Age or how uh, difficult the House of Representatives was in the 1840s or how polarized the Republican Party was in the early 1960s or how, uh, how frayed things have seemed to other parts of, of our history. Uh, may be willing to think that in their conscious history, this is a more dysfunctional system than they uh, <laughs> that, that they have seen. And so, I think the the main political um, question or that the main effect I see of the next year plus of politics on our dealings around the world, with all of the uh, gradations that, that Karen was mentioning and that you all know about much better than I do, is the question of whether we are showing in the course of our campaigning. And in the legislating that goes up, uh, that goes up to it or doesn't, and then the uh, the media coverage of it and the faces of America uh, that that are, are seen, whether we're showing a nation that is not able to match its still enormous resources to its considerable uh, problems, 
Um, just two other anecdotal points here. I was again in Australia during one of the Republican debates that had the uh, the unwelcome crowd noise. I can't remember whether it was the death penalty cheer or the uh, the the let him die cheer. But I was with a bunch of, of of Australian students who just were, you know, they were suddenly all turning to look at me, saying, "What kind of place are are, are you from?" And I was trying to explain the diversity of our national culture and. You know, <laughs> Etc. And the fact that one or two people in a crowd could sound really, really large, but there, there is, there is, there's a tension to this about people looking carefully at our our uh, our, our, our fitness. Um, the, the the other uh, was was a, a discussion I was in in Beijing, I guess a, a couple of months ago, where people. The Chinese leaders were saying, "You Americans think we're so insuperable. We have, you know, we can build anything we want." And then one of the Chinese speakers would list the twenty urgent problems China had, all of which were worse than any problem we have. Which certainly is true. The environment is a catastrophe. They have many, many worse problems than we do. But he said, "We have worse problems, but it's a higher probability we're actually going to deal with them than you are going to deal with this mild, you know, small little heap of problems you have." So, so to wrap all all this up, I've been impressed in the part of the world I've seen over these past five years that people know something about us and know something about the the curve, the normal curve in which our, our excesses run. And there is some look at the mechan- what we reveal about ourselves in this campaign process, the way it's covered, the way it's waged, about our basic ability to match uh, resources to problems, which I know is the main mission of your fine organization. <laughs> Karen, I'm tempted to turn that right back on you and ask you what you, how you see the curve over time and how you, you know, as compared to other um, campaigns that you've covered or other times that you've been covering national security in an election context. You know, we're all sort of always tempted to talk about how this is the worst X we've ever right. seen. Well, I, I, you know, in, in the daily newspaper business or the 24-hour news cycle, we kind of deal in immediate problems, and so we're always, everything always seems the worst. But you're right, I've been uh, around long enough to have been through other really terrible, I mean, I think of the early 80s, when things were on the foreign policy front just a, a real mess. And I think that by, by citing all these problems, I, I don't, you know, as I said, I think that, I, I actually think the administration gets, a, gets an unjustified rap on a lot of them. My point was just to say that, that they're all difficult problems and that the, the economic situation and the political situation, which, which I think it's fair to say is particularly Polarized just makes them that much more difficult. Um, you know, I take I take what 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 Jim said about uh, different periods, and you can go back and read history. You can read congressional debates from uh, a century ago, and they're horrifying. And you can't uh, imagine that people would talk that way now, and they probably wouldn't. So that it's all. It's all relative, but but I do think that there's kind of a perfect storm happening at the moment, where where you have um, again the economic problems, you have this enormous political polarization, um, and you have a lot of international difficulties all kind of converging at the same time. So now this is the point where we let the audience members in on the action, um, questions, provocations. Yeah, Paul. Um, <clears throat> and you should probably tell us who you are. Uh, Paul Glass was from the, with Washington Monthly. And he's, an, he's another recovering speechwriter. So, so this is a recovering speechwriter question. Um, Heather will remember that in the 90s, uh, uh, the Clinton administration um, began and ended two wars in the Balkans, in Bosnia and Kosovo. Each war ended well with the loss of not a single American service person in combat. Um, Yet, she will also remember that when uh, Milosevic pulled his troops out of Kosovo that day, there was a great battle within the White House about whether the president would give a speech in which the word victory was used. (laughs) And eventually, the political side of the White House won and the word victory was used. But it was a battle because Democrats tend to not like that. (coughs) Lots of talk of Europe and cooperation, but not victory. So... Uh, under President Obama, uh, there's been one military uh, operation started and almost finished, and that's in, in uh, Libya. 
at so, at, so far, as far as I can remember, President Obama has not given a national speech to the American public about that, uh, where, where that operation is. At some point, Muammar Gaddafi will be captured or killed. And so my question to the two speechwriters, and maybe to, to Ben Rhodes over here, <laughs> is at that point, will President o should President Obama give a speech in which the word victory is used? Well, I have to say, I feel like I've had to go out and comment on at least two speeches that Obama has given. We gave one address to yeah. the nation, a primetime address to the nation on Libya at the beginning of the... Yeah. And victory wasn't used. So that's a great, but should he use the word victory? Jim. My experience, of course, is in the Carter administration, so I have no familiarity <laughs> with... <laughs> so... Um, I think it's it's fine to use victory in a Libya speech if it if it's if it is contained in, in how it is, is described. If there's victory in the effort of having regime change, of getting Qaddafi, etc. I think that when it's ta- when you're talking about long term efforts in the Middle East, uh, it, and and actually I did have experience in writing a speech after the Camp David agreements, and, and I don't believe the word victory was there, but it was talking about an important step, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are parts of the world where you want to be cautious about applying the word victory. But if properly uh, constrained and defined, I think it would be a good thing to say. I, I, I don't think, it, I don't think you, they would want to describe it as a U.S. victory. I mean, it's been couched throughout as an assistance effort for the Libyan people. And so, you know, I can see calling it their victory. Um, Perhaps it's a, it's a victory in, in NATO collaboration and getting the uh, European NATO members to expend a bit more effort and, and, and money. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't see, it, in the way it's been described up to now in the speech that Ben mentioned and, and, and other descriptions of what the, what the policy goals are, I don't, I don't think they'd want to call it a victory. And, and in all of those areas, you know, it, they've consistently described it as, as assisting the people of Libya, of Egypt, of wherever to, you know, attain their legitimate rights. So it, I don't see why they would ever describe it as, as our victory. As, I think it's fine to say it's a victory for people of Libya, people of Egypt, you know, mankind, etc. I, I guess my question is, is that politically wise? In this election year, it doesn't matter. The unemployment rate is all that matters, in my my view. Again, having seen this uh, up and seen it down, that, that's uh, well. I, I think that's an interesting concept. I mean, you look at the poll ratings of being Obama's doing pretty well on on foreign policy now, and they've had the they've had the the um, terrorism victories. They've had you know they have the Arab Spring, which I think they can take some credit for. So I don't think they're really hurting so much in that area, but but I think Jim's right. It's it's not where it's at now. Yeah, although I have to say I'm sort of getting to the point that I'm, there's so much uh, conventional wisdom on the idea that the national security won't matter at all in this election that I'm ready to, I'm yeah. ready to buy lots of stock in the idea that national security will matter. Um, so, and you know, one thing that I think about specifically on the on the Libya issue, frankly, is that you've got the wide, broader point of this is a victory for the Libyan people, and so on and so on, which I think Karen's absolutely right about. But in the context of American domestic politics, you know, people who know who Gaddafi was, people still remember Pan Am 103, and so in that sense, there's there's some some political capital to be won there. And that Doug Wilson is frantically waving his finger down here, and what of course I'm hoping. <laughs> is that instead of asking a question, he actually is, is, has got a comment he wants to make on this. So, Doug. I, I have no comment. <laughs> I, I just have a question. It, it, it's to both of you, and it has to do with the emerging, to use the term loosely, Republican presidential uh, group of candidates. Um, the whole litany, Karen, of issues that you went through in terms of challenges that are going to face this administration in the next year are all going to face whoever wins in 2012. Before that happens, you're, we, we are faced with a budget debate in Congress where a sense of world view and a sense of what matters in national security is going to have to be addressed by a lot of people in Congress, including those who, who don't really want to address that because they, they look at spending in, in pure black and white terms. And my, my question to you and to Jim as well is, 
if you were writing an article for the American people about what kind of standards they ought to set for measuring national security capabilities of the Republican candidates that are before them, what would you write? Well, I, I don't think I don't think I would write that kind of article because I don't do advocacy or, or opinion. But I do think it's legitimate to to put them on the spot to say, look, again, here are these challenges. What have they said about it? What what's the context of it? How close to reality is it? Um, I think it's as I as I was saying before. You know, it's fine for them to stand up as everybody has and say, you know, I'm going to bring America back. Um, to strength and make America on top, and you know, I mean, to the to the extent that people are actually influenced by that, I think it's incumbent on us to say, you know, to try and pull that apart and ask them what they mean and ask them about specifics. Um, you look at the at the congressional debate. I mean, Pakistan is a very good example where you see you see the House, um, you know, last week saying, okay. Uh, you know, we're, we're cutting this money. We're putting we're putting uh, restrictions on this money. No waivers. Um, that's what we're doing. And yet, they're not responsible for saying. And then what? You know, what happens then? Um, so I think that's the kind of thing that that we hopefully are are explaining and and putting them on the spot. I mean, I started. I don't know, a month ago, I, they said, well, will you write a thing about, you know, where are the Republicans on foreign policy? And I started kind of reading what they'd said in the initial debates, and I, I couldn't think of anything to write, you know? And I said, I... <laughs> well, I said, look, let's just wait. First of all, wait till the field gets thinned out a bit, and then let's, let's wait until there's going to be a real concentration, which hopefully there will be, that is not on deficits or taxes or or social issues or, or real questions about about uh, national security and and foreign policy that that actually provoke answers beyond I'm for strength and and you're not so I, I will quickly emulate a politician by answering the question I wanted to answer and then then I will will get to, to your actual question uh, <laughs> the the question I want to answer was um, about whether foreign policy is actually going to matter in this campaign. I was being flip and saying, no, 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 it's just the unemployment rate. It is a very significant factor for the Obama administration that, that if you imagine the alternative universe in which things in Iraq were seen as going really to hell uh, as opposed to being sort of constrained, if things in Afghanistan were going to hell much more than they are, if there had been some nuclear incident with Pakistan, if there were outright border war with Mexico, if uh, Osama bin Laden were still releasing tapes, all those things, it is a the fact that he is not vulnerable on all those fronts. He doesn't have the situation Jimmy Carter did where Election Day 1980 was the first anniversary of the seizing of the hostages, and every single night before that there had been nightline you know, with, a, with a countdown of people being held. It really matters for the president that he is, is not vulnerable in those ways, and secondarily it matters that he'll be able to frame his election campaign partly on, yes, I'm going to give you a job, but also there's a lot of com complex things going on in the world, and we have Rick Perry or we have you know, wh whoever, whoever else. So it, it does matter, but it seems to me that the, the, the more swing factor at the moment will be the, uh, the, the economy. On the question you ac actually asked of what the standards the American people should hold, to me that is the job of the parties in the campaign. You know, the job of the, of the Democratic team will be to say, you should judge the whole package of what we've done, which includes all these foreign, these international successes and long-term things we're doing uh, domestically. An example they'd want to have as a somewhat cautionary one is in the 1992 campaign, George H.W. Bush's entire argument is, look, I'm the guy who's the most experienced person on earth, and I just won this big war, and you know, stay with me. And Clinton, uh, in Carville's words, said, look, it's the economy. And so I, I think it's a matter of answering your question of what should be the standards are applied. That's what the whole, that's what the next year is about, I think. So let me ask you, um, supposing that all changes, I mean, this the, the hostage crisis in the Carter administration. So, you know, North Korea tests again, which yeah. actually seems not so much a possibility as a probability. Um, an interesting thing that's just been pointed out to me, I mean, Chavez dies. Um, the Iranians... Castro dies. You know, Castro dies. Yeah. The Iranians do something crazy. Mm -hmm. 
um, the situation on the Other ground in the Middle East. Other people in that region do think something gets crazy? gets more complicated. Yeah. Um, you see a lot of demonstrations in the Middle East, which the Israelis respond to in a way that causes yet more demonstrations. Um, suppose this all changes six months from now, um, and that we are actually in an environment where there's an, there's an, I mean, even if you're in an environment where you feel a lot more security threat, does what you're saying still hold, or are we actually in a completely different environment? I, I tend to agree with Jim. I mean, I think that, that barring a major terrorist attack in this country, um, Israel's involvement in a shooting war beyond the border back and forth, um, total collapse in, in, in Afghanistan, I don't think people are going to pay a whole lot of attention. I, re- I really don't. I mean, those things I think people would pay a lot of attention to, but I think that, I just think that people are so fixated on, with, with reason on the economy that, that things that don't change our life or de- measurably decrease the sense of personal security here, um, I don't think. So, and so all of you in the Obama national security team can think, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. You know that, that anything that's working well becomes a yeah. you know a irrelevant. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. the problem. Yeah. Get, it, that, this is life. That, to the extent that the Republicans <laughs> manage to to continue to depict the president as weak on on foreign security foreign policy, then it it contributes to the me- the larger message that they're talking about yeah. about weakness in terms of the economy and and jobs and it. But it's but it's not the major. Uh, yeah, but people who are clever about conveying images, as I assume there are some uh, associated with the administration of this next year, the fact the weak image being contrasted with the things he has done internationally, the people he has eliminated, there must be some way to offset those. Again, I speak from the Carter administration where the, the, the failure of those efforts, uh, it made any kind of random thing that came up, like the killer rabbit episode, some of you may, may recall. <laughs> It put that in a different light. And so at least you know, there is this sort of background fact that uh, the administration should be able to work with. Michael Cohen, you get the last question. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, you know, I, I know this, this kind of wonderful irony tonight that you know, NSN was created in 2005. The idea of it in part was, was informed by the fact that a Democrat had just lost a presidential election um, because he was seen as weak on national security. Um, and it's sort of amazing to think that we've come in six, seven years since then, to having a uh, Democratic president who's now seen as a more policy as an asset. It's a great irony and maybe tried to give this support if I wanted to matter for the election in 2012. Um, but this has always been the issue for Democrats. You've never had, I, I can't remember any situation in which a Democrat running for president where foreign policy was such an, what could be such an advantage for him. And so I guess the question, this is maybe asking too hard of a question, but is this, how much, how resonant is this? Do you, guys, do, you, do you think this is something that will, that will live on past this administration? Is this a temporary thing? Or has there been a fundamental shift in how voters perceive Democrats on national security? And, and I ask in the context that you think three of the last four elections, if you include the 2006 midterms, Democrats have had an advantage on national security. Is this something that's going to continue, or is this a blip on the road? You mean the, you mean the high, relatively high standing now on, on national yeah. security? I mean, I, I would think you could attribute that to... to Events to high-profile events, you know, Bin Laden, um, the uh, Arab Spring in general. I mean, I think that the fact that there's been no big attack here, um, so I, you know, I think that that's that. What what becomes a harder case to make is, no, we're actually doing a good job on Iran because we've developed this range of sanctions and we've brought other allies in. And I mean, that's a hard campaign argument to make in terms of, of saying, you know, and we've, we've made us stronger. So I, I think one of the challenges they have is, is to, is, is that's certainly the message they've been putting out, but, but to, to really develop that message and make it into a, a kind of dumb it down a bit and, and make it into a convincing argument uh, without, you know, beating your chest and saying, no, we're really strong. So... I, I will end on a uh, properly acidulous note for, for a DC journalist. There are, there are things in life that are unfair and are very difficult to change. And I think in modern times, the objectively it's been the case for a very long time, the Democrats, in my view, have had a harder and tougher national security policy. 
but in an era, for example, when you are going to see Republican candidates like Rick Perry shooting off pistols, and you're not going to see many Democratic candidates outside, say, West Virginia doing that. It just is is a, a hard sell. And and maybe if Jim Webb were running for the for the presidential nomination, you could say, okay, he could have all of his combat pictures. But just is very. It, this is a difficult but not impossible challenge. And I say not impossible because. We've seen in the last generation Republicans not be able to deal with one accurate impression of where they stand and deal with one. They have not been able to change the impression that they're increasingly a white party and sort of the conversion of the white South, the Republican base. This gives them long-term difficulties with the, uh, the, the non, non-white electorate. Ronald Reagan was able to change the impression even now that they are, were a party favoring the rich by talking about the death tax and, and, and making it seem as if he was the tribune of the sort of lower middle class and above, you know, making the divider line see, seem to be most people against the poor rather than most people against the rich. So the Republicans very effectively changed their sort of Herbert Hoover era identity from Reagan onward. So perhaps Democrats could change their, um, their identity as being not as strong as they should be, whereas in reality they have been the stronger party in my view. And so with the proper next generation of uh, imaginative people, perhaps that change could come about as well. So part of the problem with uh, having a panel with two assiduous journalists is I think that that casts me in the role of optimist. Um, and I have to say what's, what's um, wonderful is actually the challenges you both laid out are exactly the challenges that we're all engaged in trying to meet, both in the short term but also in, in the longer term to lay out the idea that this set of policies that we're talking about, and you know, I have to say, one of the things that we fantasize about at NSN is the day that uh, we have two parties competing over our fabulously pragmatic and principled yeah. policies, which is a day that I think we all devoutly hope to see again. Um, but that, in fact, these things which these two folks have just laid out as being difficult and not impossible is the task that we're all engaged in every day with your help. So um, thank you all very much for coming tonight, for doing all you do to support us, for being out there every day. Thank you to our friends in government, um, who those of us who have served at other times in government remember how hard that is. Thank you to our friends who are outside of government and making it possible for us to do what we do. And uh, thank you to our fabulous panel for yet another evening. And um, we'll see you back here next year, and we'll, <laughs> we'll see who turns out to be right about the importance of national security in the campaign. So thank you.